friends, distinguished guests, sisters and brothers in the struggle of the Palestinian people for their national rights. It's a great honor to take part in this important conference. And I want to begin by expressing my uh, great uh, debt, and I think it's a debt shared by Virginia Tilly as well, uh, to Rima Kalaf for uh, initiating this uh, study, which was really a, a brave undertaking in the context of the way in which the United Nations functions. And her uh, willingness to stand by the report was something that was very courageous. And her principled resignation from the UN and continuation of her efforts through the creation of this new organization uh, is something that uh, expresses the depth of her vision and, the, de and the, uh, the breadth of her vision and the depth of her commitment. And, and it's, been, it's been really a privilege for us to work with her over this period. Uh, we, did not, uh, we didn't expect uh, to be, that this report would be greeted with uh, smiles and applause at the uh, uh, headquarters of the UN in New York. At the same time, uh, we didn't, uh, at least I didn't anticipate the kind of firestorm that it generated. And trying to think about that, because I think it's important, I, th I feel uh, increasingly that uh, Israel senses its own illegitimacy. And because it senses that, it, it responds hysterically when that challenge is rooted in law and evidence and factual, uh, factually based argument. It doesn't meet the argument. It makes no attempt to engage substantively. What it attempts to do is to discredit those that make the argument and to uh, act as if in some way uh, it is so defamatory that it doesn't deserve to be considered. And, and it, because of the way the media operates, especially the mainstream media, it does have the uh, detrimental effect of shifting the conversation uh, away from the substance and to this uh, question of uh, was it a biased report? Is the UN itself anti-Israeli? And is this one more uh, indication of a trend toward anti-Semitism? All of those are uh, distractions from what is a, uh, an argument that I think cannot easily be refuted if one looks at the evidence and the facts and the law. And what distinguished this study, uh, I mean, uh, as some others have said, the uh, notion of, of apartheid and the way in which Israel governs has long been a kind of activist slogan. What changes that is to uh, bring forth this reasoned argument grounded in international law and reinforced by uh, well-subscribed uh, uh, ideas about racial discrimination and uh, uh, segregation and repression. And I think that the, what, we, what was achieved by the report 
is to uh, influence the discourse, especially the discourse relevant to the conflict, especially uh, relating to how it can be ended. And that's sort of crucial in my view, because the principal slogan of those that were trying to promote some kind of political compromise was uh, end the occupation or uh, land for peace, making it appear to be a territorial conflict rather than involving the dispossession and dispersal of a people. See, and what, what is uh, distinctive about this uh, dynamic of apartheid as it ev has evolved in uh, the Israeli control of the Palestinian people is that it not only involves this physical oppression, but it involves a deliberate policy of fragmentation and dispersal. And that, therefore, it's not a territorial or spatial notion. The refugees, the involuntary exiles, uh, the minority in Israel itself, all of these are victims of a systematic effort by Israel to do what had, from the Zionist perspective, seemed impossible. How do you convert a society that had uh, no more than 8% uh, Jews uh, into a Jewish state? How do you create a Jewish state in a non-Jewish society. And from that point of view, apartheid was always uh, implied by the Zionist project. It really, uh, it, it really hasn't just been something that was uh, unfolded after the 1967 war and the uh, occupation di dimension. It was always necessary to subjugate those that you could not uh, disperse. The, uh, the Nakba, of course, was uh, notable for uh, influencing the demographic dynamic that uh, needed to be addressed by uh, Zionism because its own legitimacy was premised on this combination of uh, being a Jewish state and being a democratic state. And you couldn't do that without uh, ethnic cleansing. So ethnic cleansing was at the, at the root of this, uh, the consummation of the Zionist project in the creation of Israel. And the other, the other, uh, dynamic that made uh, uh, this, dyna this process so cruel so far as uh, the Palestinian people are concerned is that the Zionist settler colonial project unfolded at a time when colonialism was collapsing everywhere else. In other words, Zionism's was swimming against the flow of history. So in order to prevail under those circumstances where it would undoubtedly generate resistance, it would need to rely on coercive terrorism, essentially, in order to achieve its uh, stability and goals. And it was, of course, uh, allied in this process uh, by having the geopolitical uh, uh, support, which has become ever more unconditional from the United States, the most powerful country. So it, it's this combination of uh, geopolitics and the need to uh, uh, go against the collapse of colonialism that has made this 
undertaking uh, so extreme in its, uh, the forms that it has taken. And that, the, so in, intrinsic to the uh, apartheid experience in uh, Israel, which is different in my view from the experience in South Africa, is this uh, need uh, to exert that uh, extra uh, coercive and ideological uh, uh, manipulation uh, to, to uh, do what has not been done anywhere else in the world. There's nowhere else in the world where a colony has been established in the period since the end of World War II. I mean, it's, it's a, um, uh, it, it is in that sense a dystopian outcome that rests on violence and a structure of apartheid. So the, uh, I, I feel that's the uh, central message embodied in the report and the implication of that study is uh, one that has been alluded to by Rima Kalaf and others, is that there is no path that we can discern to, to a sustainable peace except by dismantling this apartheid structure. It is, uh, I call the, at this stage, the two-state solution is a ghost solution. It, or a zombie salute. It's something that has died long ago, but somehow resists burial. It, it, it lives on in this uh, sort of post-mortality way. Uh, and uh, it, it s seems to express the absence of either moral or political imagination on the part of most governments, that they know privately that there's no possibility of uh, actualizing this kind of uh, two-state solution. At the same time, they don't want to let go of it because by letting go of it, they seem to be letting go of the uh, idea of a Jewish state. And that, uh, is see that seems so politically incorrect on the intergovernmental level. And, and it, it, even for the Un United Nations, which has really betrayed its mission in relation to Palestine. They took responsibility after the British mandate, but they've not been able to, ex to fulfill that responsibility because they have been uh, sufficiently dominated by geopolitical forces. Let me say in the time that I have remaining, uh, a, a few of the things that have altered since uh, uh, our report was uh, released in March of 2017. And one of the most interesting, which has also been uh, commented upon, is the uh, basic law of is the Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people. Because if you th uh, think critically about that law, it's really uh, an acknowledgement of the essential apartheid allegation. It's really embracing a hegemonic way of uh, relating to the Palestinian people or to the non-Jewish people. And it's so dramatically incompatible with the notion of human rights, which rests on the proposition of equality, of human equality, and uh, to establish a state where there is a uh, oppressed minority as a, uh, what does that say? Oh, okay. 
I probably went too far. Uh, uh, no, no, I know, I know. Uh, the, the, uh, but this law is very important because it makes it awkward for Israel to really engage in any kind of dialogue about uh, the future. And it relates to the difficulty, I think, of communicating with at least the Israeli leadership uh, because it can't, uh, uh, it can't face the uh, challenge that, that exists on the basis of this uh, pretty clearly established apartheid structure. Uh, and so I think that that's uh, one very important development. Another very important development is this, uh, in this period, the rise of a series of allegations that those who work as activists for a for justice for the Palestinian people are increasingly uh, smeared as uh, engaged in anti-Semitic anti work. The BDS campaign, the, court, the attack on the Labour Party in uh, Britain and Jeremy Corbyn in particular. And it, it's, it's, in my view, a sign of the weakness of the uh, Zionist uh, movement at this stage, that it, because of its inability to engage substantively, it resorts to these kind of uh, really quite disgusting tactics that one wouldn't have expected in uh, uh, advanced, suppo supposedly advanced democratic societies. And the uh, the leverage that is exercised by these uh, militant Zionist tactics that should be unacceptable, even in the height of the anti-apartheid movement uh, it, against South Africa, when the BDS campaign was uh, becoming very effective, there was no thought of suggesting that those that were supporting BDS were somehow engaged in a, uh, a racist enterprise or that they were uh, themselves uh, criminally uh, responsible for misconduct. It, this is something quite unique and actually it contributes to an atmosphere that, that generates anti-Semitism because it, it seems to suggest that Jews control the media, control the governments, that, ev that there's an intimidation that is uh, completely, uh, uh, it, it is completely unconnected with the reality of what these people uh, are seeking by supporting BDS or by uh, uh, engaging in a uh, campaign to reform the way in which uh, foreign policy toward the conflict is exercised. That should be uh, uh, matters of legitimate debate. And the fact that it is not any longer possible to talk for a political candidate to talk critically about the behavior of Israel is a shocking failure of contemporary liberal democracies. And let me end by saying that I think that the way forward is definitely to uh, extend this uh, commitment to uh, exposing the apartheid nature of Israeli governance and domination of the Palestinian people 
and to make the point cl as clear as possible that peace for Jews and Israelis as well as for Palestinians and Arabs depends on the ending of apartheid. Without that ending, there will be no peace for either people. Thank you very much.